Tapered tuning pins were used in American pianos. I'm not really sure when they started being used, but they can be found in quality pianos well into the 1890s. Um, they fell out of favor after that for straight shank pins, but historically they had a long period of use. And I have to admit, I've never tried to um, restore and reuse a set of tapered tuning pins. When restoring a pin block in some older grands that had straight shank tuning pins, we have cleaned up those pins and reused them. But we've never done that with a set of tapered pins. Tapered pins actually require a different type of hole in the pin block, and in essence, since they were you know, put past by all manufacturers by the turn of the century, um, it only seemed natural to put modern style tuning pin systems into anything that came with a tapered tuning pin to begin with. Um, now this tuning pin is from the Chickering 33B and I have already cleaned and reblued it. Cover that in another video. And this is the modern equivalent that, well, I have to admit, I was prepared to replace these with. And I'm kind of glad at this point that I did not, but we'll start with the detail that prompted the consideration. Um, as you can see, the exposed tip of the original tuning pin and its modern equivalent really look nothing alike. And looking at some older restorations that I've seen uh, once you're sensitized to the difference um, modern pins look terribly out of place particularly the older the instrument you are considering so the question was asked can these original pins be reused well as you can see the uh, you know the cosmetic condition can be restored well enough. The question is can you get one of these tapered tuning pins to function in a new block? My first foray into it was particularly surprising and now that you've seen what these are, I'm going to switch to diagrams to show you what I actually experienced. But, as I said, this is about tapered tuning pins, so the real business end is down here below the block line. Let's see if I can zoom in. 
close enough to make the uh, distinction clear, but perhaps you can see it. Um, this pin, as you can see, is straight shanked. And it measures 282 thousandths down its entire length. This pin, on the other hand, I hope you can see it, has a taper. And it starts at 284 thousandths at the top and winds up about 250 down here. So, they tend to grip the wood in entirely different ways. And I was to come to learn that when I tried to install one of these in a hole designed for one of these. So, let me move to the diagrams and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, here we are in diagram, and I guess the first question I faced was, can the tapered tuning pin simply be driven into the same straight-sided hole that you drill for a straight shank tuning pin? And my initial guess was that, hmm, no, you may need a tighter hole for the tapered pin. My thinking went, the hole on the two, for the straight sided pin, they're both 248. You're trying to drive a 200 and 81 thousandths pin into it. So that's going to give you a, what, about 15 thousandths compression on all sides. But it's going to be you know, the full length of the pin and the full 20 thousandths. And I thought, now that's, okay, that's a lot of a lot of compression. Now, on the tapered pin, what it seemed to me you'd have is the top, 284, 281, pretty close to each other. You know, so you'd have basically a lot of compression up here, and since 250 and 248 are next to the same thing, you know, the resistance would run in a tapering out event and I thought that you know if I have equal grain compression up in this region you know I fairly consider it but if it disappears on the way down you know this pin should probably be fairly easy to drive into the hole and in the end, not have as much torque as I need. Uh, the exact opposite turned out to be true. Um, it was with great difficulty that I got this pin into this hole to any depth. Much less work than driving this pin. And the torque went way above anything I would need far before I got it any to any depth that would have been useful. So, something else was going on. And what it came down to in my mind was that as you drive this straight-sided pin in, it smashes this much wood to the side. 
and then the next one smashes this much wood to the side and things just slide by from there on. And on the way down, it's basically a repeat of the same thing. Push some wood to the side and the rest just slides by. In the tapered pin, what happened was the first pound squeezed on that much wood and went in a little bit. The next little bit wanted to press that much wood. And the next one wanted to press that much wood. The next one wanted to press that much wood. And it just got harder and harder and harder. And it was clearly impractical. Now, I really did not want to drill a bigger hole. See, a bigger hole might make it work easier, but the bottom of the hole and the bottom of the pin, I don't want to get them too far away from being, you know, I don't want the bottom of the pin floating in a hole. That turns this thing into more of a lever rather than a post. So that, that was out. So the next thing was to figure out a way to make a hole that can accept a tapered pin. And I will show you what I did for that. Okay, back at the diagram, my challenge, since I can't actually put this type of pin in this type of hole is to create this type of hole out of this type and of course the the first and obvious solution would be to get a tapered drill bit they can be made they're available but you have to provide them with very precise um, information on what degree of taper you need and while I was looking into these tapered pins I gathered up a few varieties that I had and what was clear was there's no there's no one set uh, style of pin. Some are long with very little taper, some are long with a bit, big taper, some are short with a really big taper. So no one fluted bits or tapered bits gonna help you. So what I figured I needed to do was to create a progression of holes of increasing width in order to simulate a tapered hole. And luckily I have a very special tool that makes this quite feasible. Um, it's called a spoon bit and it, well, it's clearly, it's just a rod of tool steel with a flute ground out of it. But what makes it particularly good in this instance is a, it doesn't take anything off of the side except for what it wants. And it has a blunt rounded end. So when I send this down the hole, I'm going to draw a little bit out of exaggeration. One flute will come down and take out wood like this. And instead of as a brad point bit would do, take it off at a 90 degree and leave a sharp bit there, or take it off 
at an angle like a regular drill bit would, this has a round face. And that leaves a very light ripple in the surface instead of a big bit of wood sticking out. And then the next one would come down like this, about there, and also come in. And this, in theory, would give me a wood socket that will accept that pin. The question wasn't, um, can I make these tapered depths? The question was, how deep do these have to go to make a functional pinhole for this particular tapered pin? And uh, that's what I'll show you how I did next with my little jig. Okay, these are the tools that I've wound up using for this process experiment. Now we may look at it. First is a T hammer, and what I would point to is that the T hammer, unlike a tuning hammer, has a four point socket in it. And these four point sockets are just so much more positive on these older pins. See how firmly that fits? And you now I'm going to have to make a tuning hammer out of one of these because really these fit pretty well in these new star tips. See how there's eight points in there, not just four? Um, they fit well enough, but I think I get a much more positive sensation out of a four-point socket. So I'm going to make a special tuning hammer out of one of these T-hammers. But this is what I use to manipulate the pin in this process. Um, quarter inch brad point drill bit. Um, you know, high speed helix. Uh, throws the chips faster, keeps the bit cooler. Always recommend them. Brad point lets you know precisely where you're touching. And so you can do a pretty precise job of positioning your tuning pin holes, which you know, really can't wander all over the face of the block, so gotta have one of these. But this just gets me the quarter inch hole to start with. Now, the secret weapon in all of this is the Piano Man's spoon bit. And as you can see, these are nothing more than a um, piece of tool steel with a flute routed out down the middle and it creates a uh, you know a crescent moon shaped object that when you turn these into a hole can shave just a smidgen of wood off the sides at a very precise size and because they are blunt tipped they don't shred the inside of the hole they leave a nice smooth surface and these come in various sizes um, to correspond with the various size tuning pins and precisely how I was going to apply these 
I figured out in my experimental setup, which I'll show you now. This is the experimental jig I set up to figure out just how to apply these spoons to this problem. All I really did was drill a bunch of quarter inch 248 holes um, in the block, just like I would a normal block. And these ones in the back are just slipped into the holes. These ones in the front, I didn't really hammer them in or jam them in. I simply kind of turned them until they reached a natural stable friction. And they sort of didn't really want to descend into the block any further. So when you look at it, what you can see is that each pin was able to seat itself about three-eighths of an inch into the wood, given the wood's natural compressibility. And each one of these holes or each one of these sizes by the spoon bit squeezes on a different segment of the pin. And I might note that the pin seats very nicely at a good tuning pin height in the 278 hole. So I'm not going to need the large one, which because it was only a thousandth of an inch off, never provided any extra support at all. So it's just the natural hole and the first and second sizes of tuning bit or tuning pin bit. And basically, um, By subtracting uh, the heights of these things from the height that I want them to be, it's not a big mathematical challenge to figure out just how deep you need to open up your holes. The depth that you have to work your spoon bit to is basically defined by the distance from where your pin reached its natural compression maximum up to the old pin block line right there. Because you want to move this point that far down into the block. And that is why this one is set for about that deep. Noting that the uh, there's a lot of blunt nothing on the pin. So, and this one needs to go what? About that deep. Hence, this one is set up for that depth. Between the two of them, I want to get a hole that's staged out slightly, but grips the pin from its very tip all the way up to 
the fulcrum point. So let me drill a fresh hole and I'll fight one live. That, by the way, is the total tension on this piano, which is actually light. <laughs> and that's the number of pins. So, you know, on average, these pins have to hold 160 pounds with stability. So that's why I am being... extra cautious. So let me show you the next step. Okay. Freshly made, right below my dire mathematics, is the quarter inch primary hole. And I'm going to widen the hole. First spoon bit. And that's just about the tape. And that's about just about the clamp. Okay. Just It's not too hot. I can hold it in my fingers. So the friction's not that bad, but yeah, it doesn't go, it doesn't come out any easier than it went in. Okay, that's my first one. Here's the second one. pins you can see it certainly slides farther into the hole and it goes in well, it's off camera but one of these tiny ones so put it in Let's see what kind of a seating we get Turning in pretty nicely. Yeah, a little tough to turn by hand, which is 
Nice. And that looks to be about the right pin height for this particular piano. The uh, piano has, you know, it's like four coils for most of the uh, plain wire and five coils in the trailer. So the becket's got to be fairly high and the coils were fairly high. pin in our prepared hole and put a torque wrench on here see what kind of a reading I get I have not tapped that pin into the hole at all yet so this is just an initial look and I get Okay, I'd rather move the, uh, the wood than the pin, and um, it'd be about hmm, mm, nine foot pounds. That translates to. Simple math. All right, using the T hammer, I have this pin set well into the block. guesses it's got about nine foot pounds at least eight foot pounds this is just a simple torque wrench but eight nine foot pounds tr translates into 90 to better than a hundred inch pounds and that is a good pin torque, especially if you can move it small increments. So I'm pretty pleased with this. This is the type of result I was hoping for. And uh, I think the technique can be fairly straightforwardly adapted to any of the tuning pins that I found. So let me know what you think of this one. I figure I shouldn't leave this subject until I have at least touched on some of the reasons why this system was used for so long and why it might be, you know, perhaps a better system than the modern system. And one of the reasons is simplicity of use. Maybe not simplicity of uh, preparation. The pins are more complicated to make, I think, and the, uh, the holes are more complicated to make, but during the stringing process, the modern system, you have to start banging that pin in from up there. And you get resistance.
resistance all the way. It takes a number of strikes. Now, with the tapered pin system and another prepared hole, as you can see, the pin starts out two-thirds of the way down into the hole and builds up friction from there. This certainly would make stringing a faster, more simple, controllable process, and I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how that works. The other distinction between straight, sh straight shank pins and tapered pins is that if you have one of these driven into the hole, you have to turn it up, 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 and you can see the threading on this. It takes quite a few spins to get it out, and all of that is under intense pressure, and you build up heat if you don't take serious time. And you can glaze the inside of the hole, and you basically wear out the hole. And if you try and put the pin back in, um, it has nowhere near the torque it had before, and it may not have sufficient torque to hold the tension. And the only option then is to put in a larger pin. They usually go up, go up by about six thousandths. So you can never really get the same pin back in. Now, let's see, let me take a nice precise measurement of how high this particular tuning pin is so that I can be sure to get it back to the same depth. There we go. That's within a small light gap's worth of accurate. So let's take this pin out. Well, before I do that, let me check the torque on it. And happens every time. And yeah, it's got a good a good eight foot pounds anyway on it. And that's a hundred inch pounds, and that's good pin torque. So take this out of here. So, let's see where it's at. And you can see I've got a, I've got a little ways to go down. So let's put it back in. Still a little tall. Still tall. I could just as easily be tapping this in, but let's just stick with the formula. Oh, that is just so close enough. see. 
Yep. No noticeable drop in torque. And before I leave this, I want to do one little experiment. Just give this one good little tap. Move it all. <clears throat> Not really, it's still. Mm -hmm. I have to whack it a little harder, but I'm back up to my hundred inch pounds of torque on it. So that's a pin that's come out, gone back in, and you simply can't do that with a modern pin. So, it seems there's method to some of the madness. Well, let me know what you think. I hope this helps out.